is risen. He is risen indeed. Woohoo! Woohoo! Welcome to Renton Church of the Nazarene. I'm, I'm Pastor Paul Johnson. It is good to have you worshiping together this morning. This beautiful Easter Sunday morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I can't hear you. Oh man, I hope that you are shouting and celebrating in your homes. This is Resurrection Sunday. This is what we live for. This is, this is the heart of our faith. Jesus came back to life. I know that you might would rather be here, but we are together even though we're separate and, and, and this is celebration. Open your hearts this morning. Allow God to work. There's a, in my message, I'll, I'll talk about it, but I'm, I'm praying even right now that this becomes one of those pivotal moments that is defining in your faith. Allowing God to, to seep in even further, to, to touch you. You are his. Lord, I pray that you will fill each of these homes and the people that are watching, whether they're with family or by themselves, and that you'll bring peace, and that you'll bring comfort, and that you'll bring hope, and that we can celebrate life on this beautiful Easter Sunday morning. Pour yourself out on us. And I pray that you'll have your way, that we will be your church, and that we will celebrate life. I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. I serve the risen Savior. He's in the room today. I know that he is living whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome, boys and girls. My name is Pastor Carrie, and I am so excited that you are here with us this morning because today is a special day. Do you know what day it is? That's right, it's Easter! Uh, now, boys and girls, do you know why we celebrate Easter? Why is Easter so special and important? 
Hmm. Is it my birthday? Just kidding. It's not my birthday. Is it, oh, Easter egg hunts and the Easter egg bunny? I mean, those are cool, but that's not why we celebrate Easter. Is it Jesus' birthday? Now, we're getting closer, but Jesus' birthday, it's Christmas is when we celebrate that. So, Easter is when we celebrate Jesus' resurrection. <gasps> resurrection is a big, fancy word, meaning that Jesus rose from the dead. <gasps> now that calls for a celebration. Let me see your best celebration dance. I hope you danced with me because Easter is huge and important and amazing and Really, we wouldn't be Christians if it wasn't for Jesus rising from the dead. So let's celebrate today, boys and girls. So there's this traditional thing that we that that Christian churches have been doing for years and years and years and years and years. When we're all together in the same room, it's better, but we can still do it from inside our individual homes. I'm going to say he is risen. And you are all going to shout, He is risen indeed! You ready? He is risen! Now, boys and girls, I, I said to shout. So I mean like, top of your lungs, wake your neighbors. He is risen indeed as loud as you can. And you can wave your arms and celebrate. Ready? He is risen! Now that is what I call a celebration. Okay, now boys and girls, I want you to think back to a time that was a really special or even sad, just an important time in your life. Because we, we have those throughout our lives and we tend to remember things really well. We can remember what we saw and how we felt and even the things we tasted and, and the smells, we can remember those. And Jesus' resurrection this time was like that for Jesus' disciples and even for us today. And so, so let's go back. Let's put ourselves in the shoes of those disciples from 2,000 years ago. So two days before this, it was Friday, Easter's Sunday. Friday, Jesus was arrested and beaten and he was nailed to a cross and he hadn't even done anything wrong but the religious leaders they were jealous of him and they didn't believe that he was truly the son of god and they had him arrested with false charges and he died on the cross and he was put in a tomb it was like a, a cave and they put this big heavy rock in front of it and they sealed it and they even guarded it with some soldiers because they were afraid that Jesus' disciples were going to come and steal his body. And so that's what it was like Friday, all day Saturday, and the Saturday was the Sabbath. And so the Jewish people, they stayed at home. They didn't do any work. Sunday came and several women came to the tomb because they wanted to put some um, special spices on Jesus' body to prepare it for burial. So imagine the shock of the women who went to the tomb that morning to prepare Jesus' body for burial. They slowly, sadly walk up to the tomb, expecting to see soldiers guarding the sealed tomb. Maybe they don't believe what they're seeing at first. They rub their eyes and look again, their mouths falling open. The stone was rolled away from the tomb and the soldiers are lying on the ground. They walk into the tomb and look around, but, but Jesus is gone. They're so confused. They can't understand what could have happened. They walk out of the tomb and suddenly two angels appear. The women are so scared, they fall to the ground. The angels speak. Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. 
Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. What? Could it be true? Is Jesus really alive? They rush back to share this amazing news with all the rest of the disciples. Boys and girls, get ready. He is risen! He is risen indeed! When Jesus died, he took all of our sin and our shame and guilt on himself. And it was buried with him and crushed. And then when he rose, he defeated that sin and death and guilt for all of eternity. And he made a way for us to be made right with God. He purifies us. He makes us holy and clean because of his blood shed on the cross. We can be made right with God. And that is the best news ever. And that is why Easter is so amazing and so important. Boys and girls, I pray that you will know the love of God, how high and deep and long and wide it is. It is never ending. God loves you so much. And I pray that you accept Jesus' gift of forgiveness and enter into a relationship with our loving, amazing Heavenly Father. May God bless you abundantly on this special Easter day. Bye, boys and girls. He has risen. He has risen indeed. The morning stars, they wear. The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was formed. His body on the cross, His blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon Him.
the stone was rolled away his perfect love could not be overcome now then where is your sting our resurrected king has rendered you defeated for He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. There are moments in our lives that leave such deep impression that a certain smell or a sound or a song or an experience, sometimes even a specific time of year, takes us back to that place. There'd be the flood of emotion, memory, feelings that draw us back into where we were. The proposal and the yes. Scoring the winning point of the championship game. First kiss. Birth of your child. I'll, I'll never forget any of the births of my five kids. But Dakota, my youngest, my Beautiful little Dakota. Lydia tried so hard, so hard for a natural birth and hour after hour of labor and, and they finally took her into an emergency C-section. And it went fast. At that point, it was, it was right at midnight. As a matter of fact, we got to the rare opportunity to choose Dakota's birth date. They pulled this precious little person, this priceless little girl, out of her mama and she wasn't breathing. I sat there holding Lydia's head and watching the doctor work take Dakota over to a separate stand and lay her down. And I'm sitting there praying. Lydia couldn't see this at this point and going, oh God, be with this little person, be with my little girl. I'll never forget. And when Dakota, what seemed like an eternity Seconds, moments later, begin to cough and sputter and move. Uh, my heart leapt, I will never forget it. It's imprinted into my mind and into my spirit. There's those that have experienced being in a crash or when you experience shocking news, will you forget if you were alive on September 11th, 2001, where you were, what you were doing when you heard or witnessed the news unfold on the Twin Towers. The last goodbye. A baby's dedication, graduation ceremony. Maybe experiencing for the first time God's grace and faith in Jesus, the freedom that God brings to us and gives us. Sometimes there's a place, a, a, maybe a special cabin or a camp spot where your family goes year after year, and, and when you visit, memories and feelings flood back into your mind. Laughter, games, late night movies, the feel of the fire from the fireplace, the comfort of a familiar chair, meals, games, cookies. Yeah, okay, there's a story behind that one. We, my, my kids and I had several exchange students and at this point, we, we actually had two exchange students. I won't get into the whole story, but we had just picked up Grace, who was going to stay with us from Korea for several months and ended up living with us for three years and graduating from high school. She was 13, almost 14, but, but 13, visiting our family. We picked her up from Boise, loaded her in the car with all of her stuff, jet lag, she's tired, all this new experiences. She's trying to be polite. The language is still a struggle for her English. 
We take her to the house in Nampa. We unload all the stuff. We say, now pack up just a few things. We're going to the mountains. We load her back into the car, Suburban, and we head up to McCall for a three hour drive. <laughs> Talk about getting indoctrinated into a family, but that cabin was our special place. It wasn't ours, but it was our special place. My kids all have such good memories. And in that week, Grace bonded with our family, mainly with Jesse, our student from Beijing, who brought a brand new book called The Cookie Bible. And Grace and Jesse made cookies all week long on that January in the mountains in McCall. You share life in these places. These places take on a significance of their own. What are those moments in your life that are rooted, connected to a place that causes you not just to remember, but to marvel at what occurred there? What do you see and feel when you remember those places of significance in your life? Sometimes, sometimes we relive breathtaking joy, but sometimes tied to a memory or tied to a place, we experience intense loss and pain. Now, I want you to try to imagine Peter experiencing this phenomenon in his life as he reflected on his last few days with Jesus. I want you to think about especially his highs and lows and all that took place in those last few days. Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Could you imagine? The triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Hosanna, Hosanna. Jesus washing his dirty feet during the Passover feast. Prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane where everyone except for Jesus fell asleep. The heartbreak and feelings of loss when Jesus said, Peter, you'll deny me. Peter goes, no, no, I'm not going to deny you. No, Peter, you're going to deny me. You're actually going to deny me three times. Three times before morning. Peter experienced the betrayal of Jesus from Judas with a kiss. False accusations, a kangaroo trial by the religious elite. And then Peter, Peter denying Jesus, not once, not twice, but denying Jesus three times. The rooster crowed. Jesus' words would have flooded back into Peter's broken spirit, tears would have flowed, guilt consumed. Peter's world turned upside down as he watched Jesus being led away to be beaten, whipped, mocked, and nailed to a cross that Jesus was forced to carry. He was forced to carry through the Via Dolorosa up to Golgotha. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Can you feel Peter's pain, guilt, and remorse? This man told Jesus that he would be with him no matter what. He made a commitment to his Lord and King, Jesus, that he would go with him to death if that's what it took. Jesus, I'm yours, period. Anything. Peter believed that he would be faithful. But Jesus died on that cross. The sky turned dark. Peter knew life would never be the same. He and the other disciples huddled up together, all but hiding from the religious leaders that had finally put this Jesus down, who had finally, forcefully, and forever put down Jesus and his ragtag followers with death. Death on a Roman cross, the zenith of human torture, finally put an end to this Jesus. The religious leaders, their power, their systems, their life, their world could finally get back to normal. Their world could finally turn right side up the way that they saw it. Peter and the others huddled and kept their heads down. They sat in stunned silence as the Sabbath came and went. Peter stewed in his thoughts and unable to escape his regret and shame of betraying Jesus. Then came the news no one expected. Now, don't ask me why no one expected this good news. They should have expected it. They were told in advance this would happen. Didn't they listen? Did anything that Jesus taught really sink into these men? 
Were all the disciples completely and utterly thick and useless? Makes you wonder, doesn't it? So the women came back. The women came back and said, Jesus isn't in the tomb, he's risen. Now, you'd think there'd be shouts of joy. You'd think that there would be celebration when the disciples heard this news. I would think that there'd be a, a running, a, a rush down to the tomb to see for themselves. But no, if you thought that, you'd be wrong. Not only did the disciples not hear Jesus when he said he would rise again, but they didn't believe the women when they claimed to see an empty tomb. They didn't see it. They didn't understand it. It didn't fit with their picture of Jesus. Now, all four Gospels document the resurrection, all four of them. But Luke's account has a detail that I want to explore this morning that gives insight into Peter and instructions for us. Instructions. Something that we can hold on to on this incredibly beautiful Easter morning celebration. Now, if you have your Bibles, open your Bibles, your app, or look at the notes that are um, perhaps in front of you if you're joining with us on the live chat. Luke 24, verses 1 through 12. Again, Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they, the women, went down to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day, rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all of these things to the eleven and to the rest. Now, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women with them who told these things to the apostles. <laughs> But these words, these words seemed to them an idle tell, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Peter went home marveling at what had happened. Lord, again, thank you for your word. Thank you for Easter, for your gift, for your son, for Jesus. Open our hearts and open our spirits. Pour out on us as we think about, reflect, as we marvel at your miracle. I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Could Peter ever forget what he saw that morning? An empty tomb. Remember, this is before Jesus asks Peter if he loves him three times. This was before anything was confirmed. This was Peter looking for a dead Jesus and finding an empty tomb. Hear that again. Peter was looking for a dead Jesus, but found an empty tomb. In verse 12, he went home marveling at what had happened. Some versions, if you read, use the word amazed at what he saw. Some say wondered or wondering what had happened. Now, this word marveling, amazed, wondering, in, in Greek is thaumazon. I'm not even going to claim that I'm saying it correctly. Thaumazon, which means to wonder, to be in awe, to think deeply about. Peter went away from that experience in thinking deeply about, amazed at what he saw. Peter, like Jesus and most of the Jews at that time, had traveled in and out of Jerusalem all of their lives for celebrations and community. Peter would have been very familiar with the hills and valleys around Jerusalem. This was the great city that had been part of his life and all the Jews' lives for as long as they could remember. But once those moments happened with Jesus, once these significant pieces of life took place with Jesus, 
all of those memories would have been tied into these experiences. He experienced with Jesus places like the temple, the upper room, the Garden of Gethsemane, the Via Della Rosso, Golgotha. It's reasonable to believe that Peter could not unsee any of what he experienced in those particular places. And he marveled. He marveled. He reflected. He continued to be in awe and think deeply about what had just occurred. He continued thinking about these events and conversations and moments with Jesus as he tried to make sense of what it meant. Now, even though Jesus had been telling his followers that he was going to suffer and die and rise again, nobody expected it to happen. I, I love this part of the story. They were told. They knew. They lived with them. And yet they didn't expect it to happen. Just think about that for a moment. This is a story about us. What all do we really know and understand? What, what do we know and intellectually believe up here, but we never really expect? How often do we go, yeah, yeah, I believe that, but, oh, God can do anything, but. This was a faith issue for his disciples, and it is often and still a faith issue for us. Happy Easter. The story of the resurrection isn't a history book story. It is a life of resurrection for us, for faith, to know and to believe, to enter into deeper relationship with the living God. We don't simply need to learn about Peter. We need to learn from Peter, who on that Sunday morning went to the grave, found it empty, saw the grave close, and marveled, was awestruck, was wondering, focused on, thought about what he saw. Now, if they were expecting Jesus to come back to life, why would the women be heading to the tomb with spices for the body? They weren't expecting it. If they expected a resurrection, they would have acted like people of life. No, everybody, including the disciples and Jesus' other followers, thought the dead Jesus was placed in the tomb on Friday and would still be dead on Sunday. They didn't have any doubt. Why would they believe anything else other than that they were told? Now, when the women came back from the empty tomb, after hearing what the angels had said to them and tried to relay this good news to the rest of the disciples, they were dismissed as crazy, emotional, maybe delirious with grief. They were not believed. They were discounted. They were ignored. Notice again how Luke describes this unforgettable scene in verses 10 and 11. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to them. So they didn't believe it. Now, I'm not sure men have changed much over the last 2,000 years, but that's another message. Something triggered inside of Peter he headed to the tomb. He looked in, saw the grave clothes, but Jesus was gone. Peter left the tomb, marveling, wondering in awe, but not fully understanding. He still didn't get it. But he knew he didn't get it. Peter's life had been turned upside down during his three years of hanging out and ministering with Jesus. It was turned inside out when Jesus died, and Peter and Peter deserted, denied, and abandoned him. There are times in life that are just hard. There are times we simply just don't get. Right here. This is where Jesus was kneeling when they uh, came and grabbed him. 
Um, and I, uh, I came in from this direction with my sword drawn and I cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. I <sighs> reacted exactly the way Jesus told us not to. And Jesus. He picks up that man's ear. And he puts it right on his head. Like it had always been there. But that's what he did. Jesus was always fixing people's messes. You know, um, I said I didn't know him that night. Three times. Three times. I denied my friend. He told me I was going to do it. <laughs> Before I even did it. And like an idiot, I argued with him. <laughs> but he was right. <laughs> He's always right. He told us he was going to die before he died. But you know what he did? You know what he did when he came back to life? <laughs> That morning when he came back to life, he gave me the opportunity to tell him I loved him. Three times. Three. He knew, he knew that was my greatest regret. But that's how he does it. When it settles here, it changes here. And that turns the past upside down. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what happened that night because of what happened that morning. Because he beat death. He is alive. <laughs> it doesn't matter what happened Friday because of what happened Sunday morning. It doesn't matter what happened last night because of what can happen this morning. We're all living in the upside down right now. The world is literally upside down. Who would have ever imagined Seattle streets being virtually empty? Lydia and I went for a drive the other day just to see what the city looked like and the streets were virtually empty. We went for a walk last night. Two cars went by us during the entire time. I would love to have all the answers, but on this side of heaven, it all of us inevitably have more questions than we have answers. This pandemic that we're experiencing, that we're going through is life-changing. The world is very different at this moment and we can only speculate on what will emerge over the next few weeks, months, even years. Maybe the Seattle area missed the worst of this by isolating early. Ah, that would be wonderful. But nothing is certain yet. The people of New York, New Orleans, and other hotspots have been on my mind in prayers. Could you imagine being at the hospitals or working in the, the very center of this mess and literally losing a person every two minutes? We are in the middle of suffering as a nation and as a world. Now, going back to Peter, Peter wasn't pondering on a global pandemic, but wanted to know where Jesus was. 
Peter was living in his failure and shame and wanted to find Jesus. And when he found Jesus, when he talked to Jesus, nothing else mattered. Good news then and now is Jesus brings life. We all have significant defining moments in our lives. We all can think of memories and places that take us back in time, thought and feeling. Right now, if we just begin to reflect on our church family, Roy passing away, his funeral is on hold. So hard for the family for closure. Postponing the wedding, my heart breaks for Abraham and Julia. March 28th was the big day. You're going to be a married old couple by now. Well, at least married. But man, your faith and your attitude are contagious, both of you. Imagine being a senior in high school right now or in college. Life is on hold. No graduation ceremony, no prom, no pomp and circumstance. Look at our broader community, family passing away in isolation without comfort, without closure. Job loss, anxiety, instability. Oh, Jesus, we need you. We need you, Jesus. Right now, the COVID-19 virus has the attention of the world, but then we plug in other moments of our life, the things that all combine to make us who we are, the, perhaps the proposal that was made in it was a no and not a yes. The celebration of a new birth, but the baby died a few days later. Maybe the first place that we called home and had security and warmth became the place where the divorce happened. What are your moments? What defines you? Where do you need Jesus this morning? Sometimes, those moments happen in significant places that mark us with difficulty, defeat, and despair. But God has a way of meeting us in those moments and walking with us, leading us into a place of new day, of new hope, of resurrection, of life. Jesus had to die to be resurrected. Let me say that again. Jesus had to die to be resurrected. In order to experience resurrection, first, a death must occur. Oh, don't misunderstand me. We serve a God of life, of hope. We worship a Savior that not only can relate to our circumstances, but also has defeated sin, death, Satan, and hell. What if the place you find yourself in at this moment, on this Easter weekend today, isolated at your homes, what if this place, this moment, becomes one of those significant and memorable places that you'll always remember as pivotal? What if? What if now becomes a place of such deep connection with our living God that it continues to change you and touch you and transform you forever? I pray and hope that even in your homes with your families or even in isolation, you feel strength, comfort, community. I pray that you will experience the fullness of God right now at the place you're at this moment. We don't worship the grave. There should be some amens. I should be hearing amens all the way here into this building. We don't worship the grave. We worship the Son of God who is alive. Oh, may your life and spirit be filled with hope. Our hope is in a living Savior, not a cold slab of limestone, limestone that once served as a temporary placeholder for his human body. We serve a resurrected Jesus. I pray for the power of the resurrection, for the life of Jesus. I pray that that is on you. I pray that you will think about and marvel, <laughs> reflect, be amazed by the good news of Jesus. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Oh, 
rest yourself in that truth on this Easter Sunday morning. Lord, we need you. We need you now. And I pray that right now where everyone is, is that wherever they're at, where they're, where they're watching or experiencing this worship service, I pray that you will pour out your spirit and that there will be life, that there will be resurrection. I pray for healing in this world, in our community. I pray that whatever normal is going to come, that oh, we get to be part of that. I pray for your life. I pray for your comfort. And I pray for your spirit. Jesus, I thank you for your sacrifice for the life that you have poured out on us and that we can celebrate Easter and celebrate life beyond our imaginations. God, if there are those that are hearing this message, maybe the gospel, the good news of what Jesus brings for the first time, would you, would you reveal yourself? God, for those that are suffering, would you bring peace? And God, if it is in your will, bring healing to our bodies and to our spirit. And I pray that we will be your church, a church of life in our community, in our homes, in your kingdom. I ask all this in your name, Jesus. Amen.
has risen, risen Woo. indeed. Oh man, I hope you've had an amazing Easter Sunday worship and celebration. As far as announcements, yeah, about right. Wait, Carrie, shouldn't we thank everyone for all the virtual help that we had with our massive celebration yesterday? It's pretty amazing. Hundreds of kids, thousands of eggs, candy, and God blessed with such beautiful weather. <laughs> right? Yeah. What we're praying is that we get that beautiful weather again next year when we actually are able to have some sense of normalcy and community celebration. Thing. Thank you to all the volunteers that are sending in information, that are putting in their, He is risen! The celebrations, the scriptures, this is a lot of work to do this together virtually. Thank you. And we have a few more weeks of this, so I'm sure Carrie's going to be contacting you. Scripture, testimony, praises. Woo! We're glad that all of you are part of this. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. <sighs> but I'm glad you're here. We're going to wrap up this Easter service with receiving of God's tithes and your offerings. It's a, a spiritual act of worship to give. And again, I want to be clear, especially if you've just tuned into this or you're not familiar with church. Church is not about trying to get your money. The church exists to come together and know and learn about God as you experience God. The giving of your life, the giving of yourself becomes natural and a blessing. So I pray that as you know, God, that you'll be blessed. During this time, we are reaching out as much as we can to help and to provide. And if you need anything, please, please call. If you're running out of stuff, call. We, we've got some extra toilet paper, really. I think we could find it. If you need food, if there's anything that, that would be of help. <sighs> But in the meantime, celebrate your family today and life, call each other. Figure out ways that we are the church in the middle of staying at home. Lord, thank you for the chance to give, for the chance to be your church, for your hope. I pray that you'll take the gifts that are given today and through this week and that, oh, multiply. Give us wisdom to use those funds to build your kingdom in the way that you desire. And again, I thank you for this morning, for all that you've done. Amen. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Tomorrow to lay down your sorrow Freedom is here today 
wipe away those tears, child, and put down your shame. Oh, I see an empty grave. I hear the heavens waking, angels in jubilation. That stone's been rolled away. I feel the darkness breaking. I bet the child go and tell the news what started in the garden was finished in the tomb it's all reversed the apple the curse three days in the ground christ our lord is risen death couldn't hold him down He is risen. He is risen indeed. May the loving power of God, which raised Jesus to new life, strengthen you in hope, enrich you with his love, and fill you with joy in your faith. So, we're going to start. Here we go. Yeah, like legitimately, that should be good. Oh, that's nerve wracking. One, two, three. What if I sound like a nasty piglet? Gucci. <laughs> She's gonna record it this time. You ready? You're recording. It says R E C. Yep. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He's risen indeed. I'm. One, two, three, four. He lives. He lives. Wait, he lives. I lost the note. Ignore that. Take two. Back up. <laughs> Ready, go. He lives. He lives. Christ, Christ Jesus lives today. He, he walks, walks with me and talks with me, with me along, along life's narrow way. Does my hair look all right? Hopefully. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Okay, choir practice is over. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>